Well, welcome to Word Live Bible Study. Glad you are all here and joining us. Would you go ahead and invite Fran? You know who Fran is, friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Invite somebody to Bible study. This is one of the few full book expositions, um, Bible study expositions, really in the country. And so invite your friends from wherever they may be here in North Carolina and in the United States as we collectively, as one body, one family, study the book of Ephesians. And so we're studying the book of Ephesians this year, and we're titling this study, Masterpiece in the Making, How God Really Builds Out His Body. And that's what we're going to talk about today in great detail. I want to talk today about the issue of a building that lasts. And I want you to be convinced of why and how you can be a building that lasts. And so let's pray. And then turn with me in your Bibles after we pray to so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21. Let's talk to God. God, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for your loving kindness that is better than life itself. And I pray now, God, that as we study your word, you would strengthen us. I pray as we study your word, you would heal us. Pray as you as we study your word, you would restore people to yourself and we would you would reconcile people to one another. I pray, God, for every individual, every family that is listening, that we all, God, might be guided by your written word, that we will live and not die. So, Holy Spirit, enable me to rightly divide the word and give us now, God, information for our heads, inspiration for our hearts and implementation for our hands. Speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have your seats if you're at home. Get your Bible and your notepads out. Ephesians chapter 2. Let me read into your hearing beginning uh, at verse number 20. I'll read down to the end of the chapter, which is at verse 22. And we're spending last week and this week on these three verses. We find these words recorded as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 now. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Man, it's so loaded. This is, we learned last week, this is the Apostle Paul flunking freshman English. This is the Apostle Paul who is literally uh, loading up, if you will, metaphor over metaphor. And now we're in this issue of the metaphor of the church this ecclesia, this gathering of those of us who come together, he, he uses the metaphor that we are a body. And that's what I've been, I've been, I've, we are a body and now we are a building. So I want to spend time today dealing with the issue of the building. And this is about being a building that lasts. We spent all of last week talking about the foundation of the building. I'm not going to rehash that because we learned last week that I spend time pouring a firm foundation. And Paul was very clear. Let me tell you, just like in our homes, the foundation may be cement, brick. He's saying my foundation of the church is built upon the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. He was clear with us about that. Now, this week, I want to spend time on the next set. Foundation has already been poured. Now I want to talk about the framework, the framework of this building. Started with the foundation, Roman numeral three in your handout. So I want to talk about the framework of this building. It's all in verse 21. In verse number 21, he says, in whom the whole structure, do you see that? The whole structure, the framework, it's all coming together now. In, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, I want to say, let me give you the next blank. 
And then I want to spend a great deal of time talking about this framework. Jot this down. We grow by both addition and by maturity. We grow both by addition and by maturity. And this is very important because, and I'll use our church as an example, we are a large congregation. We, we honor God for that and we're humble before God for that. But just because you grow numerically does not mean you grow spiritually. And we have to recognize that God does not want to limit our growth just simply by numeric or growth of addition. I mean, you think about a child, for example. I mean, I know a bunch of folk that <laughs> they get older year by year and they don't get more mature. You know, like a bunch of folk, you know, it, look, it's bad enough being a fool, but you don't want to be an old fool. I mean, and so I know a bunch of folk that's 30 acting like they're 12. Right. So just because we grow by addition or numerically does not mean we grow by maturity. Conversely, when we grow in terms of our maturity, there is an element of numeric or additional growth that occurs. And oftentimes we miss this because we will judge or criticize large churches and say, well, you know, growth is not just about numbers. You're right. It is not just about numbers. It is about both numbers and maturity. And so it's important. I don't want, I mean, I don't want to have more people at Bible study and say, oh, our Bible study is growing. But if the people that are attending Bible study are not growing in their walk with God, if we're not learning how to love one another, if we are not learning how to suffer together, if we are not learning how to be faithful, if we are not learning how to be committed, if we're not learning how to be whom God has called me to be, then just because we have more numbers does not mean there's maturity. So I want to spend a great deal of time talking about this framework from the lens of both addition and maturity. Because Paul clearly writes to us in verse number 21 when he says to us, in whom the whole structure, that's all of us, that's an important point, in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So the fact that we are a, a, a whole structure, notice what it says, whole. Everybody say whole. It's a whole structure, meaning he does not just want parts of the structure good. He wants all of the structure good. This is very important, y'all, because if it's you and your wife and your children at home or you and your husband and your grandchildren at home, what he's saying is, I don't want you to be a good grandparent and a bad spouse. I want you to be equally. I want the whole structure working. I want the husband and wife good. I want the kids good. He's saying, I don't want you just to be a family that is in good health and then not coming to church. I want all of you good. So he's very clear. This issue of a thrive life at Word Tabernacle, this issue of making sure that we prosper in all things, which is really a theme for us in 2021. This issue of making sure that both my faith and my finances and my family and my fitness is all maturing and all growing. That's the part. That's the point part of this. He wants the whole structure. He's saying, y'all, you know, he's saying if, if, if your electric is on, but your water is off, you still don't have everything you need in the house. He's saying if the water is on and electric is on, but the roof is falling down. You still don't have. He says you have to pay attention to the whole structure, the whole structure. This is very important for ministry for us, because oftentimes we don't see we don't see the connecting point between uh, the music department and missions or the connecting point between youth ministry and women's ministry or the connecting point between the nursery and men's ministry. And this is something we all have to recognize. We all have responsibility to each other for our collective growth together. He's saying, I care about the whole structure. He, he doesn't want the, 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 the music good and the sermon bad. He doesn't want the church being held up by a good message, but the worship is not right. He, he doesn't want us to have good in-house service, but then we have bad outreach. And he doesn't want me to have so much outreach that I'm ignoring the people in the house. Already I'm teaching good for us to recognize that he's saying he's saying he the whole structure 
is joined together. Say that with me, together. It's a whole structure together. And, and I want to talk about this issue of us having responsibility to each other. I have a responsibility. If we're in the same body, that in the same building rather, we're the same building. If you, if you frame a wall out, if, if one stud is good, but the other stud is corroded, it's, this good stud is then forced to have to hold up the weight of the bad one. And at some point, it can't hold up the weight on its own because the other stud is not holding up its weight. How many of us have had to have to shoulder the weight of somebody else because they're not holding up their end? How many of us have had to step in the gap for somebody else because they're not showing good work ethic? How many of us have had to step up and do for somebody else because they didn't take it seriously upon themselves? We have to recognize that we have a responsibility to each other, the whole structure. If the men's ministry is great, but the nursery is not, it hurts the structure. If, if media is wonderful, but drama is not, it hurts the structure. If, if one thing we do is on point, but the other stuff is not, it damages the structure. And it is not fair to people that have made themselves available to be a part of a structure and part of a building to have to bear the weight of other people who are not as sincere about growing, and growing in their maturity. We grow by both addition and by maturity. And I want to spend a great deal of time. I want you to jot this down. I want you to jot down. Drop this down. Stretch me. And I want you to say it to yourself. Stretch me. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask you to do something that I hope you'll be able to you'll be able to, to receive. Begin praying starting after this Bible study. Whenever you listen to it, whether you're listening to it uh, live when we normally release it or whether you're listening, driving to work on Orthos podcast, whatever you're doing. I want you to begin praying that same day. I want you to add one thing to your prayer list. I want you to begin saying, Lord, stretch me. See, because this is how we grow by addition and maturity by God stretching us. And a stretch prayer is a kind of prayer to pray when you want to grow spiritually. Yo, if you know someone whose depth of love is humbling, if you know somebody whose spiritual strength is amazing, then it's a real good likelihood that person has been praying, God, stretch me. And I want to encourage you to do the same thing, to say, God, let me tell you what it means. You need, do I need to define terms? I'll define terms. By the Lord, stretch me. I'm saying, God, take me beyond my limitations. Take me beyond my limits. God, God, stuff used to make me curse. Take me beyond my limits where it doesn't make me curse anymore. God, God, stuff used to keep me up at night. Take me beyond my limits so it doesn't keep me up at night. God, some stuff used to make me lose my appetite. Take me beyond me out my limits so I don't lose my appetite. Take me to a place when I get offended, I won't leave anymore because I've grown in such a place that I've been taken beyond my limits. That's what we all want. We all want as a church, as a congregation, as a body of believers, for us to say, God, as a church, as Word Tabernacle Church, take us beyond our limits. Show me a horizon I've never seen before. Show me an opportunity I never saw before. Don't let me get stuck in a place of mediocrity and average. Do you know there's, the room is crowded. If there is a room in a building called average and a room called mediocre, mediocre and a room called stretch, I'm here to tell you, very few people in the stretch room. Most folk are in the average room. Most folk are in the mediocre room. And I don't know about you and who I'm teaching to and who's listening to this, but it's time to leave room average and leave room mediocre and get residence in room stretch me, God. He wants us to grow. Do you see that in the text? He is so clear in the text in whom the whole structure is being joined together grows grows. And that's not just me growing. That's all of us growing. We have to receive this as a body and we have to recognize we have to get off of this bandwagon of I don't want to see anybody do better. 
and I don't want to see anyone win and I don't want to see anyone succeed. We ought to be able to grow together. Our desire, our goal ought to be to see every single person around us better than they were when they started. Who am I talking to that can testify? I'm, I've, I've been growing since I've been here. And, and I've even had somebody tell me, I've had somebody tell me, I won't, I won't call her name out because she may not want me to do that. But I've had somebody literally with a testimony saying, Pastor, when I came here, I felt like miracle grow got sprinkled on me. I, I just found myself growing like I had never grown before. And see, can I tell you, y'all, the importance of this issue of growth? When God gets a hold of you and builds you right, you don't just grow in some things. You grow in everything. And God will use the adversity, the negativity. Can I say it like I feel like it? The doo-doo. Because if you know anything about, about fertilizer, fertilizer has feces. And some folk don't want the feces of life to be put on them. But when you are in Christ, the miracle of it is God will use the negative ways that people treat you. God will use the bad things that happen. God will use the negative things that will happen. And God will put all of those things together. Make it into a fertilizer spiritually and sprinkle it on you. And we've got to learn to thank God even for the stuff that's not the best because let me tell you something, the stuff that's not the best, if you look back at your life, you still grew because of it. Some of us are passionate the way we are because we grew because certain things happened. Some of us have the prayer life we do and we have the worship life we do because things happen and I grew through it. And what, is, what, a, what an interesting dichotomy. What an interesting uh, a thought that, that, that in Christ, Things that could destroy me really are used to grow me. Things that will cause certain people to leave are the things that cause me to stay, that cause me to stick. And so we ought to be praying for a Lord stretch me. If you really prayed, watch this, for God to stretch you, then you would see negative interactions different. So instead of this is why church, y'all, let me park here because we are talking about the church in this in this study right now, us collectively as a body. Part of the reason church is so hard to stick with is because we are a spiritual body. We are a spiritual building. My spirit is the most sensitive part of me. My, my, my spirit is the most significant part of me. And my spirit is the most intimate part of me. So if you only have a physical interaction with somebody, doesn't work out, you keep it moving. We had dinner, we had a conversation, no big deal. When it's so a soul tie, meaning it involves my intellect, my will, and my emotion, now all of a sudden, I get a connecting point with somebody, but even if I had to depart it, I could do that. The people that know me on a physical basis, the body, that know me on a soul basis, intellect, will, and emotion, is still not the highest level of our intimacy. The highest level is my spirit, which means those of us in the body know each other more intimately than other people. The reason why people leave the body it's not usually because of offense. It's because folk in the body really know you. Folk in the church really know you. And you can't get away with some of those lesser things that you used to do. And we've got to recognize, y'all, that the significance of us being a body is so we stretch each other. I am going to offend you because we're stretching each other. I am going to make some decisions you don't like or agree with, but we're stretching each other. And one of the worst mistakes I can make as a believer is to leave when I'm being stretched. I, I want to say it again. Don't leave where you're being stretched. Too often times, just as God is using someone or something to grow me, I leave. And I go to those lesser relationships where all we do is have a conversation. It's intellectual. 
All we do is have lunch. It's just kind of physical. We don't get into real spiritual stuff because I don't really want to be around a place where I'm going to be stretched. You show me people that are active in a building, not the church four walls. I'm talking about the spiritual building. It's going to be a great word. You show me people that are active in the spiritual building. And I will show you somebody that's serious about growth, serious about maturity, and serious about being stretched. Why do you think when folk are corrected, folk are disciplined, folk are told about themselves, typically, if we're not careful, it can cause me to leave. Because we have a struggle with being stretched. Embedded in what he's saying to us is that we have to grow by addition and maturity. And my prayer request before the Lord is, Lord, stretch me. Because ultimately, I'm not molded from outside. I'm molded from the inside. Ultimately, I'm not molded simply by body and soul. I'm molded by spirit. Let, let, let me say a few more things about this. Let me j get, find you some margin and take some notes. This issue of, of growth in terms of addition and maturity is what you've heard me talk about in the past. It is the issue of understanding organization and organism, the church as organization and organism. Maybe this is a good word. I'm going to repeat this. I said this at business meeting. The church is not organization or organism. The church is both organization and organism. And this is why many churches, here's the word, here's the word, here's the word. This is why many churches do not grow by addition and by maturity. Because remember, the, the result of this body, this building, is to grow by addition and maturity. The reason many churches do not grow by addition and by maturity it's because they view theologically the church as either an organization or an organism. When it views it simply as an organism, it has, a tip, it has the ability to grow in terms of maturity, but it usually doesn't grow by addition. And the reason it doesn't grow by addition is because in order for something to grow, it has to have a structure. It has to have an organization, right? And so those who tend to see the church only as organization usually can grow by addition, but it does not grow by maturity. The church is both organization and organism. So being both organization and organism as it relates to our growth by addition and maturity. Let me tell you some ingredients of that, some parts of the recipe it, in, embodied, embedded in this building is that I have true organization. The smallest cell has organization. You tell you show me. Folk who can just preach but no organization. And I'll show you a grow, I'll show you something in the building, something in the body that will not continue to grow. We've got to have organization and cells. We've got to have something that is alive, the cell, and we've got to have a structure that we build upon it, organi organization. This is in every ministry. It, it, it can't just be that I'm gonna have. Um, church at study and we know the time we're going to do it. We know the place we're going to do it and all of that. We also have to have a living element. People have to apply themselves to study and devotion. Right. So it is organization and cells. Let me give you another thing to think about as it relates to this issue. And this, by the way, will even apply to home. This is significant even in home, because in every home we need to have structure. There needs to be Parents and adults who know what time bedtime is and time you're supposed to be home and time to do homework. But it also has to have a living element to it where we're praying and where we're laughing and we're enjoying each other. And so this issue of growing by both uh, uh, maturity and by addition is about organization and cells. But let me say a second thing. It also needs diet. It needs diet. Um, it, it needs to have intake. This is why we are we learn in verse 20 that the cornerstone is Jesus, that it was built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, meaning all of it was built on the word. 
And if you don't have a diet for the word, then ultimately we never can become the dwelling that God wants to be. I've seen many people that are real gifted, but they don't have a diet for the word. People that God has naturally given talent to, but no, no diet for the word. And, and, and y'all, we have to recognize I can't just want to serve in the nursery. I have to have a diet for the word. I can't just want to sing in the choir or direct the choir or play an instrument. I need to have a, de a desire and a diet for the word. Y'all, so many of us, we don't have a real diet for the word. And if we're going to grow and become this building that God wants us to be, there's got to be a diet for the word. And then in the midst of that, you see growth. And finally, jot this word down, reproduction. Right. That's me weaving in the metaphor of the body into this issue of the building. Now, when this happens, when we become this place of growth, because this is why I'm saying that Paul mixes metaphors, because I know what you're thinking. You're saying, but pastor, he started off talking about the building. Now you're talking about a body. The reason I'm now talking about a body is because he says the whole structure being joined together grows. I, you, I can't, this, this sheetrock, this studio, it just doesn't grow itself, right? So the metaphor here is that of a body now, that how as a body do we grow? How do we mature? And what he's teaching, let me say, let me say, I want you to jot these three words down. And then I'm going to try to get to my next main point. The first word that I want you to jot down is the word lordship, lordship. When, when we begin maturing, when we begin growing, my life is manifested by understanding the lordship of Jesus in my life. Remember, when we make our confession of faith, it is not just unto salvation, but it's unto lordship. It is us, us saying, Lord, I'm trusting you, watch this, as Lord and Savior. And oftentimes we leave the Lord off and we just want to make him Savior of my life. But he wants to be Lord and Savior. He wants to run this show in every area of my life. And if you were to begin looking at your life, you have to be honest. I have to be honest. I call him Lord, but is he really? Think about it. This is why he says the time is going to come in my kingdom where you're going to come to me and say, call me Lord, Lord. And I'm going to be like, depart from me. I never knew you. He's saying because you have lip service, you calling me Lord. But if I was Lord, I would be Lord. I'm going to say that one more time. If I were Lord, I would be Lord. In other words, if I was really Lord, don't be calling me wifey and we not married. Don't, don't, don't call me hubby and we not married. Don't, don't, don't call me son or daughter. We not related. He's saying, how can you call me Lord? And I don't have lordship of everything in your life. You still do what you want to do with your money. You still decide when and if you're going to go to church. You still decide if you're going to serve. You still choose what, what you're going to do with your time. You still make up in your mind if you feel like it or if you don't feel. I thought I was running this stuff, God says. He's saying when you grow by this issue of addition and maturity, it is manifested, first of all, in lordship. In lordship. Here's the second word I want you to jot down. Second word I want you to jot down is stewardship. Everybody say stewardship. Lordship, stewardship. He, he says, y'all, when we are growing by addition and by maturity, then I start losing my grip on material things and I start grabbing spiritual things. It, it's amazing how as you grow in Christ, this is going to be a great word for somebody. I was not always here. And as I'm getting as I'm getting older, I'm seeing more and more of this manifested. As we grow in Christ. Stuff doesn't matter as much. Let me say it that way. You, you grow in Christ and stuff just doesn't matter. You know, what, what's this? Twenty twenty one. I you know, I drive an eight year old truck. It stuff just doesn't matter as much. And I'm not suggesting if you have a brand new one, it does matter. But I am suggesting that as you get older, you start realizing the stuff in life that really matters can't be bought. The stuff in life that really matters 
It's not stuff that you can go to the grocery store and get. It's not stuff you can go to Neiman Marcus and get, so, to go to the department store and get. No, the stuff that really matters is spiritual things. You know, and, and so I want us to recognize that we begin taking our hand off of possessions, off of material things, grabbing a hold of, of spiritual things because stewardship matters. When, when I see folk that exhibit poor stewardship, it's a lack of growth issue. Um, <laughs> let me, I'll make it easy for you. See, when you live at home with your parents, you don't pay the utility bill, right? So you leave the light, you leave the room, leave the, leave the light off, leave the light on. You know, you leave the room and you know, and, and you you gone from that room and you keep the heat blasting. But when you grow, <laughs> when you start maturing. And you have responsibility for that bill. When you have responsibility for buying the groceries, you don't throw so much food away. So when you grow by maturity, when you grow in maturity, it makes you a better steward. So when I see people, even in the church, that don't steward their time, don't steward their talent, don't steward their tithe, it is a lack of maturity. We can't claim that we are mature and we're not taking care of the things of God. If we are taking care of the things of God, yes, I can claim maturity. But if I'm not, can't claim maturity. We grow by both addition and by maturity. It manifests itself in lordship. That was the first word you wrote. It manifests, secondly, in stewardship. And third of all, it manifests in fellowship. In both metaphors, Paul is communicating that there is a structure, a whole structure. Watch this. Being joined being joined together. It grows together. I want you to get this. I want us to grow together. I want us to grow together. It manifests itself in fellowship. It manifests itself in us staying together. This is why it is so important for us as believers to guard the unity of the body. It is so important not to allow anyone or to anything impact our, our, our unity as a body. You know, and, and so we've got to recognize the importance of this issue of growing. And so the first big thing that I've tried to communicate is that we've got to have this, first of all, this foundation. But then secondly, it's got to be a framework. Now, 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 last big point for this, this week's broadcast. The last big point is that after we have poured the foundation and after we are now being joined together in structure, framework, what do we do? What's supposed to happen? What, what was all of this for? Which takes me to my third and major point. Jot down the function. See, buildings that last, let me give you the whole synopsis, the whole summary. Buildings that last, make it easy, people that last are those of us with a firm foundation, those of us with a proper framework, and those of us with a clear function. Because check this out. Who do you know that builds a building to keep it empty? I mean, when you build a house, you build it to occupy it, don't you? <laughs> Every place in our church you know, it's amazing, man, because we have this 110,000 square foot facility and we're out of space. And people could wonder, how in the world can you be out of space? Real easy, because the point of building it is to occupy it. The point of building it is to dwell in it. Right. So that's my point that I want you to give you under Roman number four, letter A. Our function is to be God's dwelling place. He says it right here in the text. He says, in him you also, verse 22, in him you also are being built together, it's right here, y'all, into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. He, he's saying the whole point of this is for my spirit to live in you. He says, the reason I made you into a building is so I can occupy it. God says, I want to I want to occupy. I don't want to be homeless. I want to build something that I can live in. 
That's exactly like the church. The point of the church, some of you, this is a great word. I hope you can receive it. This is a great word. I want you to think about this as it relates to Project Thrive. I want you to think about it as it relates to us building out our final 2,000 seat sanctuary that's well underway. I know what you're thinking. Well, we, we're giving the Project Thrive so we can have a building to live in. We can have a building to worship in. We're not building us a building. We're building God a building. It's not so that we can dwell in it. It's so he can dwell in it. That's the point. That as the spirit of God, because what's the point of having a bunch of folk in the room that don't have the spirit of God in them? The whole point is for God to dwell in the building. And you know, so I want to talk about the significance of this, y'all, because I can't. God says I can't dwell in the building. If you don't surrender the building to me. Because I would then be I would I would be living in something uninvited. I, I would I would. I would be that person that just shows up in the building and because it's empty. I'm just going to force my way in. And many of us want God. We act like we want God, but we won't give him a fully surrendered house. What, what kind of nonsense would it be? If we build out a home depot and on Saturday nights use it as a strip club. And on Sunday mornings use it for church. God would be like, you, you would really expect me to show up in an unsurrendered building? Now, some of you are offended by that illustration, but you do the same thing. You get in a lap dance on Friday, but you in the choir on Sunday. And God is saying at some point, if you want me to live in the building, you've got to fully surrender the building to me. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but God wants a sacrifice from us that is without limitation. God wants a sacrifice from us that is unbridled. He wants me to literally present your bodies. Come on, Romans 12, 1. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, which is your reasonable service. Y'all, he's saying, listen, I want to have a sacrifice. I want a living sacrifice. I want you to get this. And, and thanks be to God for everyone who receives Christ before they die. So I want you to hear that. I'm grateful for every human being that gets in. But I want you to hear this. Don't wait until you're tired, old, can't do anything to say, Lord, I want you in my life. It's like it's like knowing somebody your whole life. You've you've known them for 40 years, but wouldn't marry them. Now you're tired. You're on a bunch of medication. You can't do anything. And you're talking about now I want to get married. Why would we wait until the building is falling down in order to ask God to live in it? We ought to be inviting God to live now in us. We ought to be saying, God, I'm full of youth. I'm full of excitement. I'm full of ideas. I'm full of passion. I'm full of desire. I'm full of talent. I'm full of ambition. And God, I want to fully surrender myself to you. What wife would want a man who's half the time his body is with another woman? This is the point of the text. This is what's becoming a building that lasts. That he is saying to us that we have to, if the Holy Spirit is going to live in us, the whole point of the building is to occupy it. If that is the case, then we've need to, we need to do a few things. And I'm going to give you these last three or four points that are not in your note sheet. You can write them down on the side. So let me tell you what it needs to look like in order for me to be full, a full sacrifice to God, a living sacrifice. Let me give you a few considerations. Number one, I need to start living sent. S-E-N-T. I need to start living sent. That means I'm always available. It means, God, I live my life on the altar. And I'm not talking about being all super spiritual and all that. I'm talking about just the everyday common sense stuff we interact with humanity and deal with people. That when I'm at when I'm at Food Lion, Harris Teeter or Piggly Wiggly, and I'm in the line, that I need to recognize I'm not just in that line by myself, but I'm in the line with the Holy Spirit living in this body, the Holy Spirit living in this building. And because of that, I'm gonna be careful how I treat people. 
how I speak about people, how I speak to people, because I need to live sent. I'm not just going on a mission. I live on mission. That's a good word. Because a bunch of folk who are always just going on a mission every once in a while, what are you doing the rest of the time? We have to live since in order for God to say, hey, you know what? You have shown me that you have a fully surrendered building that I can occupy. I need to live since. Let me say a second thing. Not only do I need to live since, but secondly, I need to live steady. Live steady. S-T-E-A-D-Y. I need to live steady. Y'all, that means, y'all means... I'm going to live consistently. That means I don't get, I don't live always asking for a do over. It means I'm not always asking, I'm not always apologizing because I'm wrong. It means I'm not always making mistakes. It means I'm trying to be consistent. You know, one of the things that I share with our leadership, and this is a great word for church, I know lots of pastors watch us. And this is one of the mechanisms I get to train other ministers and other pastors is through our Sunday worship and through our teaching and through our podcast ministry. People come to ministries that are consistent. That means, you know, everyone does not love James Galliott's style of preaching and teaching. And the objective is not for me to be all things to all people. But the objective is when you come to Word Tabernacle, you know what you're going to get. That's the objective. It's not that. And and it may be that what I give somebody doesn't want. But for the people that come here, they know they know he's going to take a text and preach the text. They they, they know every word doesn't come out perfect. They know every once in a while I mess up with subject verb agreement. But they know doctrinally and theologically it's going to be consistent. It's going to be steady week in and week out. They know when they get on the podcast, they get on Bible study, it's going to be an exposition of the scriptures. So people come. I mean, do you really do you really who who would go to who goes to Bojangles for a catfish sandwich? Who 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 goes to McDonald's for Prime rib. Now, you go, but look, like them or not, you know what the menu is. (laughs) Like them or not, you know what they're serving. Part of the reason many of us do not grow is because of lack of consistency. This is a challenge. I'm saying this for pastors and ministers and minstrels and musicians, people that watch us and are growing as a result of what we do. This is a Sunday by Sunday walk. The moment I'm done teaching this Bible study, this podcast, I'm prepping for the next one. And it doesn't matter what this one sounded like if I can't be equally consistent next week. This is a week by week grind. And when people begin looking at the 16 year journey at Word Tabernacle, it is the consistency and the steadiness of the ministry that makes a difference. You can't have good music one Sunday. It's a mess the next Sunday. The sound can't be right one Sunday and wrong the next Sunday. The image can't be right one week and wrong the next week. I I can't. We're building. We're building our final sanctuary. I guess you can tell I'm excited. Well, one of the things that that we're building, that we're going to do, we're going to commission an artist. It's going to be on the back hallway. We're going to duplicate the image. And it's going to be an image on the ramp going out to where the band is. The same image is going to be here in the studios. And, and it's going to have a hand, and around the hand, it's going to simply say, this is somebody's first time. And then, and then it's going to be, a, it's going to be a, a champion call. It's going to be a huddle call. And every Sunday before we go out, we just hit our hand against that hand on the wall. Hit our hand saying, it's somebody's first time. That means this Sunday we had to get it right because there's somebody that never heard the word before. There's somebody that never saw the broadcast before. There's somebody that never heard me sing before. There's somebody that never heard me play before. There's somebody that never saw me greet at the door before. There's somebody that never had my child at nursery before. There's somebody that never had my child in after school before. There's somebody that never interacted with the staff before. And for that person, if it's wrong, then it's wrong all the time. And it hurts the growth of the body. So we have to live sent. We have to live steady. Number three, I'm almost done. 
We have to live selflessly. We have to live selflessly. If God is going to occupy this body, we, we, we have debates all the time about how much do we charge and who do we give it to and how do we work this out. And you would be amazed how many times we try to practically give as much away as we can because we recognize that ultimately we are not building for us. This is not about me. This is about being selfless. This is about how we serve others, about how we minister to others, which takes me to my fourth point. We have to be servants. I have to live since. I have to live steady. I have to live selflessly. And I have to live as a servant. I got to live as a servant. That I've got to recognize that the point of this body is not to serve me. It is to serve God. The point of my gift is not to serve me. It is to serve God. It is not to make a star out of me. It is to show everyone the star he already is. That is the point of the body. That is the point of this building. The point of this building, 821 Word Plaza, Word Tabernacle Church, the Impact Center. The point of it is so that the name and fame of God, of Jesus, might be great in the earth. That people will not say, oh, look at this big church that they built. Look at this building they built. No, I want them to see how big God is, how strong God is, how capable God is, how loving God is, how caring God is. I want them to see God in his grandeur and in his bigness. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with God. That's what it has to do with. We're doing this because we want to build a building that lasts. We're not building for James Galliard. We're building for the next generations of people to honor God, to serve God, to know God, to be convicted by God, to champion the things of God. That's why we're building. Can I tell you how awesome the Holy Spirit is? When I announced my 2021 Bible study and, and said I was going to teach the book of Ephesians, we didn't know we would be as far as we are in building out our final sanctuary. So if you're tempted at all to think, well, he's just teaching this now because we're trying to build out the final sanctuary. No, I'm teaching this now because this is exactly where God has us as a church. And it just so happened that where we are as a church and where he has us in the word are exactly in the same place. Because God knew from the beginning this is where we would be. I want to I want to I want to live this Bible study out. I want to live this podcast out this week and I want to help you in your small groups do that. I hope you'll be a part of a small group. I want to spend more time talking about how we grow and strengthen in fellowship. Maybe I'll make that a podcast. But but in closing, let me give you three questions. I'll pick one or pick or do them all. Do this at home with your spouse. Do it at home with your children. Do it in your ministry areas before you begin ministry. Take 10 minutes out of choir rehearsal or band rehearsal. Take 10 minutes before you get on your next, when you first get on your Zoom call. Take a few minutes in women's roundtable or men's roundtable. Just reflect on this. Here are the three questions. Number one, how, because remember, we're talking about buildings that last. How should our interactions with each other be different because we are members of God's family? How should we interact with each other? How should it look different? Because we now recognize we are part of the same family. Second question. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, describes our equality in Jesus with three images. He describes us as citizens, as a family, and as a building. How is each of these three words descriptive of people before and after they become Christians. How, how is it that I am a citizen? How is it that I am a part of a family? How is it that I'm a building? I gave you examples today of the building aspect. How does this describe who we are as believers, as Christians in the same body? And then here's the last thing I want to leave you with. What are the benefits you have experienced from serving in your church? Because you are a person that serves, what has it done for you? What has it meant for you? How has it changed your life? How has it made you better? And I hope 
uh, if, you're, if you're about to answer that question and you're thinking, well, I'm not serving in a church, then I want you to recognize that serving in a church is not only about serving God and serves, serving God's people. It is also about building who we are. And some of us are not as strong as we could be because that strength, that mortar comes from service. So I want to encourage you to get active in the ministry, but spend some time. Maybe you could answer that question on social media. Those of you who are on social media, would you maybe go on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram? And would you maybe just share how you have personally benefited by being a person that serves in a church? How has God used that to make you better and to make you stronger? I hope the, hope the Bible study blessed you. It certainly blessed me for teaching it. I want to speak this over your life. You are a building that's going to last. God bless your people. Strengthen them for the work that you called us to do. God, be honored and pleased with all that we say and do. And I pray, God, that this week we will be able to focus on our foundation, our framework. And I pray that as we focus on foundation and our framework, we would find the clarity of our function in you. God, let this not be a building that goes vacant. Wow. God, let me not be a vacant building. I'm going to speak that over your life one more time. God, let me not be a vacant building. Because, God, vacant buildings wind up with squatters. And, God, I don't want anybody spiritually squatting in my building. I want my building to be dwelled, dwelled by you. Thank you for your word. Pray your blessings on your people. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here and for your giving today.